This lesson is on the Korean kingdoms, and this is part five of a six-part series on East Asia in the post-classical period. Now you've seen this slide before, so I'm not going to touch too much on it, but Korea, you know, the Koreas, as I'm going to call them, right, the Korean kingdoms, were periphery states for China. So you know, keep this model in mind as we go through this lesson. Right. And one of the things we want to keep in mind from the get-go is that you know, Korea and China have different roots. Indigenous Koreans migrated into the peninsula from Siberia and Manchuria, so they came kind of more by a northerly and easterly route into uh, Korea, whereas indigenous Chinese migrated more from the plains of the west and the north. And so there's some you know, inherent ethnic dif differences between uh, you know, Korea and China, but the influence was very early on. Um, you know, Koreans learned sedentary farming f and STEM practices from the Chinese from, you know, all the way back into, you know, period one of world history and the early part of period two of world history. And the earliest of those kingdoms was a kingdom called Chosun. And you're going to notice the spelling in this lesson varies um, because, of course, different alphabet, different letter system, and so sometimes in these maps that I found, uh, the spelling is different. Um, but Chosun or Joseon, um, my Korean's no good, sorry, <laughs> was conquered by the Han Emperor Wu Di in 109 BCE. So even from the early part of the Han or the middle part of the Han period, uh, you know. Korea was a periphery state to China. You know, and the peninsula was the colony of China for another 400 some years, even decades after the fall of Han. And so we see here, you know, in the map on the bottom that, you know, ha the northern half of Korea is, was considered Han territory. Um, and so Korea experienced a heavy period of what we call Sinification, right? The root Sino in English just means Chinese. Um, and that Sinification has continued till this day. Of the three East Asian periphery states that we're going to study, Korea was absolutely the most Sinified of the three. Um, you know, and so they imported Buddhism more, more wholeheartedly than either the, than the Japanese. Um, their writing system was much more closely developed on China. They imported a lot more STEM knowledge from China. And part of that was just pushed in when Korea was a, a straight up colony of China. Uh, they modeled their legal codes and bureaucracy on China. In fact, if we look up at the, the, the uh, images here, these are all Korean images of the Buddha. And I think it's really interesting. I think to me the faces look distinctly Korean, um, but the postures and the bodies of the statues here especially either look Indian or more Chinese to me at least as a Westerner and an outsider. So you see the mixing of the cultures here, but for the most part a wholehearted adoption of Chinese culture. Um, but over time, you know, politically, you know, Korea started to resist. Uh, and the, the first main adversary of the Chinese were the Kogoyuro people, um, this ethnic and tribal group to the north who stretched all the way up into Manchuria. Manchuria is the northeastern part of modern day China. And they established the first independent kingdom of the post Han period. And then over time, the uh, people of uh, Pakche. Sorry, again, my Korean's no good. And Silla developed their own um, kingdoms in the south. The kingdom of Kaya was very small and absorbed very quickly. And so usually we talk about the three kingdoms period as, you know, Kogoruyo, uh, Silla, and Pacheke. Uh, and they were the rivals for the control of the entire peninsula. Now, if you recall back to our studies of the Tong, they were a very expansionist dynasty. They wanted to conquer, and they tried repeatedly to, you know, to conquer and, and recapture Korea, um, but it was largely the Koguryo who were held very strong against the Tong, especially in the early 600s, and, um, you know, the Tong couldn't quite seem to do it until they formed an alliance with Silla, and then Silla and the Tong defeated the Pakche, and then later the Koguruyo. So it's kind of interesting. I, I don't know if we'd call them traitors or what, but you know the people here out on the edge of Silla were able to unite with the Tong. 
you know, to defeat Pak Che and Kogoruyo. Kogoruyo? <laughs> um, and, you know, so as a result, Silla was rewarded by China with sole control of the peninsula um, and remained a very powerful tribute state of China until 668 CE. So roughly about a 50-year window. Remember, tribute states where it's like, okay, we'll leave you alone and you can be your own country as long as you give us money every year or whatever it is we want. Um, you know, and, and but this helped Korean independence. And so politically, Korea remained independent of both China and Japan until the early 20th century, uh, all the way into the 19, 1900s and the time right before the uh, World War II and World and the Korean War. And so, you know, Silla's, you know, gambit here in turning on the other two Korean kingdoms was really successful for him. Um, you know, and Silla itself went through a period of intensive Sinification. Uh, they moved the capital to Kumsong and built this capital to really look like a Chinese imperial capital. I mean, here's a picture. Um, and it very much looks like, you know, the forbidden city in Beijing to me. Uh, some slight differences in the stonework and the stairs and the trees around it make me realize that it's not Chinese, but the architecture itself is distinctively Chinese. And, you know, Silla adopted the Confucian examination system and bureaucracy, um, although not quite to the level of meritocracy that the Chinese had, the Koreans tended to be more aristocratic and, you know, value those at the top. And so it wasn't as meritocratic. Really, it was only the the sons of the great fa aristocratic families who would take these exams and pass and enter the bureaucracy. This, uh, the aristocrats and the leaders of Silla also, you know, built Buddhist monasteries and pagodas. Um, their pottery was very heavily influenced by Chinese design. Although the Koreans were really good at pottery to the point where China would start importing China from Korea because the designs were so beautiful and so well um, executed. An interesting thing too, the Koreans were actually the first people in the world to develop movable type. Now, the Koreans had what was called woodblock printing, where the characters would be carved into a piece of wood, and then the piece of wood would be pressed into the paper, um, kind of like a giant stamp, like a teacher might use in a classroom. But that was very time consuming and very expensive and very slow to carve out those wood blocks. The Koreans actually developed the technology of you know, making little pieces of metal that had characters on them and fitting them into these grooves like you see here, kind of gluing them with honey or pitch or tar um, and then you know, stamping them. And then once the run of pages were done, all those characters would come out and then new characters would be put in. And this was very successful for the Koreans. They had a little bit of trouble with the metallurgy. Their metal letters would wear out very quickly, I think because of the availability of some of the metals in that part of the world. Um, but they developed the technology centuries before the Europeans did. So properly, the printing press is a Korean invention, not a European one. Um, but because of, you know, Korea's kind of emphasis on the aristocrats and the people at the upper levels, they kind of got sucked into what we might think of as a third world model. Although, again, third world is like a 20th century term. Uh, we don't even really use it anymore. We call them developing nations now. But they got locked into this periphery state model where the civilization was really only for the tiny elite. So anything like literature, art, high culture, fine products, reserved for the elite. Remember, the elite is just kind of the people at the top. And then the rest of the people kind of lived and worked in near slave-like conditions, mainly producing raw materials for export. So timber, minerals, uh, you know, farming, things like that. And so there was very little manufacturing and market exchange that took place within Korea, very little emphasis on STEM development. And so you get a tiny, kind of tiny, rich group of people up at the top, and then everybody else is just exporting those raw goods. They, they weren't exporting finished goods, right? Finished goods are things like tables and um, 
you know, fine woven clothing and, and sophisticated pottery and machinery and, th and weapons and things like that. Those are finished goods. Korea wasn't making those. And so it kind of locked them into poverty in the same way that third world states in Africa and Latin America over the last hundred years have just been locked into poverty. Because raw materials just aren't worth that much money. You know, they're just, they're cheap. They're easy to get. You don't, it doesn't require technology or STEM. It's, you know, the finished goods that make a civilization richer and more sophisticated. So because of Korea's emphasis on the elite and the upper classes, you know, it, it ended up hurting their civilization in the long run. Over time, though, the, the rulers of Silla became so invested in the elites and the upper classes that the, you know, the peasants would revolt. And this started to happen fairly regularly, and these peasant revolts were brutally suppressed by the army, which is bad. I mean, you don't want to kill your own people, and you don't want to demoralize them either. That keeps your civilization from going forward. Um, and over time, both the Silla and the Koryo regimes uh, just became weak and ineffective. And in 1392, the Yi dynasty was elevated to the throne by the elites in this kind of democratic or parliamentary process. And the Yi ended up ruling until 1910. And, you know, they reestablished the signification, but they were enough cooperative with their peasants that, you know, they didn't face that backlash that, you know, the, the rulers of Silla did. So some final notes here, right? Uh, class, you know, post-classical Korea is an excellent example of how core and periphery states work in our time period, with the whole you know finished goods, raw goods, tiny rich elite, big lower classes, um, and it's also an example of colonization by a first world core state or world power. You know, the Chinese kind of colonized Korea first, and then later on ruled Korea through a puppet government. Um, and so it's, you know, it's an example of the periphery state status and how that leads to a third world raw materials export economy with a powerful elite class. Um, and I think this is really important to consider because now South Korea is one of the leading economies in the world. And the transformation of South Korea after uh, World War II and the Korean War has been one of the most remarkable transformations of a civilization that ha that's happened at any point in human history. Now Korean STEM is some of the best in the world. Uh, the knowledge economy there is very sophisticated. Um, they have to. I mean, their natural resources are pretty well gone. It's a very densely populated country. Um, but, but Korea has really been a success story over the last 60 or 70 years because they've moved away from being a third world country towards starting to behave like a first world country and really emphasizing education and training for their people. And it's really been outstanding. I mean, you think about companies like Samsung, uh, really remarkable. So I'm going to get off my soapbox now. Thanks for watching.